Hey guys. How's Hello. It going? Welcome back to uh, The Voice in the Hollow. This is our second episode. I'm Miguel Ortega and this is Tran Ma. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll try to not make this so awkward. Uh, so let's see. So last week we showed you guys a little bit about what our concept was with this film, uh, showed you how we started modeling the characters and um, what else? Did we talk about last week? Uh, well, you showed like the whole cave pit scene. Oh, the cave pit. We showed yeah, our some of our characters, early like cloth tests, evil environments. Yes, yeah, some cloth tests. So this week we had a lot of uh, troubleshooting, uh, and some of it is still stuff that we're still trying to figure out. So um, we'll show you um, what we have here. Hold on one second. Let me just hide this right here. So let me set this to this for a second. So we started last week, we showed this really quickly, doing some tests with um, X-Gen grooms to try to get some of these huts, this village to um, to look as cool as possible. And, you know, we were a little bit afraid about the poly count on some of these things and uh, did a, a real quick conversion of uh, X-Gen to polygons. And when we brought it into Unreal, it came in really quick. We didn't use Nanite because we're doing this all in UE5. So it was all done with just straight polygons, uh, thousands of hairs, and it handled it like a champ until we toned down the lighting. And one thing that if you guys know, like some of the short films we've done, we like low-key dramatic lighting. We would never have a shot that looks like this. Um, and the minute we brought down our, our, our lighting, we found a lot of problems. It first started with this and then with some other stuff that we're going to talk about later. Basically, we've come to the realization that Lumen is amazing, but when you use low light, you start having some issues, at least with what we know so far. So we started doing just some quick tests, and this is just totally throwaway background crap, but just to see, and you can see all of a sudden, you go from this looking really nice and furry and dense to looking like yeah. a mangy pause, you know, a, pause on like the first dog one. yeah yeah like those white gaps uh in there and are not supposed to be like that <laughs> you're like oh it looks horrible so we started seeing this and we're like oh on? my god what the hell is going on here uh yeah you're seeing the geometry underneath it you're seeing the geometry through it um and we're going to talk about why. So again, don't look at any of this. So we're going to get into all of that, but let's just jump ahead and show you where we ended up. And, and by no means is this done. Uh, we honestly, you know, we suffer doing these in a way because we're like, uh, we don't want to show anybody anything until it's perfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like even when I worked in a visual effects company, like I always tried to sit as far away. I don't want anyone to, ever look behind me until I'm done. So this is kind of crazy. So anyway, so this is where we're at and, and we're gonna go through how we resolved a lot of these issues and a lot of these issues we still haven't resolved, but the workaround that we've done to basically not have as many furry things. So this is where we're at with the village so far. So this is, um, you know, we've been working on this for this week. That was the focus. Everything is, uh, um well not everything that's a total lie we we used a bunch of mega scans for all the rocks and stuff and for like the little props the problem with a lot of the mega scan props that we that we found were was that even the medieval stuff was too high tech right so you're like oh look they have chains and we can't use chains oh look at uh you know some of the tools and as soon as it has metal in it it just felt like out of place yeah it felt medieval it felt medieval it felt uh dungeons and dragons and what we wanted it is to really feel very primitive uh give me one second let me just see here just in case anyone is saying anything so hi to everybody um uh so yeah so that, that's where we're at with this uh there was a lot of troubleshooting one of the, the most obvious things that you could see here is that the furry stuff got pushed away so you can see we have one hut here. We have another uh, thatched roof here. Which that hut kind of looks weird. This one here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the other one over there looks really yeah, weird. Yeah, you can kind of see the problems even here. Yeah. Like, keep in mind, 
we, there is no splotches in these textures yet look at this roof here and look at this roof here they look like there's dark spots there there shouldn't be so that's what we're trying to figure out this roof seems to work better but it's because it's dark and i have a, sus a suspicion it has more to do with it being dark and you can't see the problems then there is no problems but uh, anyway, so we'll just jump ahead and I'll show you guys some of the things that we did. Yeah. And it's not like we don't know that we weren't going to run into potential problems, but like um, we have to do these type of testing. Like even if I mean, we've heard, you know, foliage is generally a problem um, in Unreal 5 where it's at right now. Right. This is not the final release. But just because it's a problem doesn't mean that we we should never try to understand the problem um, because there's still there's limitations for everything that you're going to do and you have to figure out where uh, your boundary is right like where what is the line we can cross what can we do what can't we do so th this is all part of the process that's super critical for us to learn and yeah. we have to, we ourselves have to know what the limitations are than just going hey people say you shouldn't do this so it's like well i don't have understanding of why I shouldn't do that. So doing this gives us understanding. And then that gives us knowledge to be like, this is what we need to do instead. Yeah. So in terms of this, before I get out of this, this screen, what we plan on doing next is we're thinking we need to have like a, a main structure, like the city hall in the back here somewhere. Uh, where we do have some bridges and we have stair stairways and whatever. So you could see like I could walk around to a certain degree here and there there's a lot of detail there's stairs and there's um, a lot of crazy shacks so you can see like our thatched roof here looks great when you get close but uh you'll see some of the issues with it later um hdri this scene uh the lighting has been crazy problematic and again, we're going to talk about that in a second. So, yeah, we watch, um, we read Unreal documentation. Just so you know, we watch almost every video we can find. Uh, we we do ask our friends. So it's not there's no magic <laughs> there's no magic button for this. So yeah. 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 So okay. So let's let's start talking about where we started out. Just give me one second. Um, so I'm not going to save that. So we'll see some of the problems here. So you can see this is like the first couple of shacks that we built. And this is going much more, less fabric, more thatched roof. We have like a little outhouse here, not an outhouse, like a <laughs> patrol tower, <laughs> a patrol tower, these little furry things. Uh, and these actually got furrier and furrier as we went. Like if you look at these guys here, they look much thinner. So these got furrier to try to solve some of the problems we had. And the best one to show the issues with is like this guy here. And there's two main issues here. One is you can see when you look at this thatched roof, and again, you can see it's all polygons. Handles it, brings it in like a champ. But when we zoom in here, you can see that it starts looking. So there's two pieces to this. There's this and then the underside. But you can see that when you zoom in, not even zoom in, when you look at it straight ahead, you can kind of start seeing areas where the hair just disappears. Yes. Like look at this area here. But as you rotate away in those bald spots, it looks super dense. It fills in. So as long as you're looking right at it, it disappears. So first thing we thought is, oh, we have to have a two-sided shader. Duh, like that's simple. We have it. That, that still didn't solve the problem. And you could see that it's constantly getting thinner. The other thing that you'll notice is that as we get to the darker areas, you start seeing this crazy splotchiness happening. Yeah, there's splotchiness all over. And that thing just drove me nuts because <laughs> you can see splotchiness. And then as we would get away, obviously we would expect an LOD switch or whatever. 
but on some of these, they would just completely turn white. You can see this guy too, same issues. On this side, you look at it there, it looks like there's barely any hair on it. And then you get up close and you're like, it's pretty dense. But again, when we look at it directly, we have those issues and we're still there are trying no, to... There are no normal maps on this stuff. Yeah, there's no... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying attention to... Uh, yeah, so I'm just responding to the chat. We'll show you what we've discovered, but there's not, it's not a normal map issue. Yeah, yeah, and this is a, a, an HDRI, yes. So the other thing is, you know, we just started building, like just grabbing mega scan stuff and building like scaffolds and windmills and all kinds of stupid stuff. And trust me, Tran ended up, while I was uh, trying to troubleshoot this stuff, I was like, Tran, you go model a bunch of stuff because we, we might not be able to use this first stuff at all. And it actually ended up working to our advantage. So, all right, so there's two problems. Problem one is the fact that when you do hair in XGen inside of Maya, the hair is always facing the camera. It's like a, a trick, I guess, that it's always facing. It's like a, a face camera, normal kind of thing. Whereas here, it is not doing that. And one of the things we're, we're thinking about doing is trying to bring in proper grooms in here and see if that solves the issue considering how easily it brought this stuff in hopefully the grooms won't be that much of a hit so here you can kind of see the problem inside of maya uh, by default you can see xgen has this thing set to face camera let me just minimize this just in case someone says something Okay, so you can see, um, oh, give me one second. Just pull this up. You can see we have this face camera turned on by default. So as you rotate around, it always looks like there's plenty of hair. The truth is though, is that is lit. It's like I said, it's facing it inside of the viewport. It's like a yeah, so the facing plane, ratio kind of. It's like the the hair plane, if the side is flat like this, it's never you never catch it at the side. It's constantly rotating to the camera. So every time if the camera rotates, it's gonna the face of the of uh, the plane is gonna constantly face the camera, and that's on by default in XGen. Yeah, but in Unreal, again, we haven't brought in a proper groom. We just brought in convert the polygons, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. We get this. So when you look at it from the side, you can see it always looks dense. But then when you look at it straight ahead, it looks like it's thinning, right? Which is crazy because like, look at that. It looks <laughs> like, holy crap. But then when you look at it, like that is, you know, this guy here or one of these guys, like none of these look like that. But um, that's one of the problems that we're having. Uh, let me see. No, this is just, so what we did is this, I'll show you like a real simple thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to do it with like anything, just starting with nothing. So we would do something as simple as like, okay, we would grab, let's say if I grab the sphere just to make it simple on everybody, if I grab this, right? So I'll make this thing pretty big. Yeah, because it's going to be pretty big. So maybe something like that. Okay, so let me find my. Um... So we were just going to our generate. Uh, we were doing interactive grooming. These settings seem to be what worked for us. Oh, it's different. Your density has got to be much lower, right? It was one, right? Or was it two? Uh, I don't remember. It was 0.5 or something like that. Uh, yeah, it was 0.5. And then your length is at 60 um, with scale, it's like at 0.6. Okay. So we created this thing. That's way too long. <laughs> and it's because of the scale. Yes. Uh, so let me just do this again. I'm just going to set it to like 30. Still too long. Yeah. And the thickness is, is still too, uh, 
I'm going to cut it in half. I'm just going to keep it shorter, like maybe... 10. Or... I think so, I'm going to do 15. Yeah, it's still too long. Okay, so we have something like this, right? So we would just go into our sculpt. We keep it super simple. We would do this from the top. We would just go to our grooming tools, bring this over here, just go to comb, make my brush size bigger, and we would just start brushing this thing down, right? So simple as this. So let's bring this down. We are making a thatched roof and we are talking about problems. Yeah. So, okay, so we have something like that. I could pull up some of these guys up on the top. And really quickly, you can see some of the issues here with the face camera on or off. Okay, so right away, you can see that. So let me just comb it down a little bit more. Yeah, this is uh, X-Gen. You know, this is as simple. Um, yeah, it's a very simple, it's not like a fine, not a demonstration of making it look pretty, but a demonstration of how we, of the problem that yeah. we're encountering. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of these things don't look pretty, period. Like, that's kind of the point. That they're yes. supposed to look like primitive uh, little shacks. So, all right, so now we have something like that. So I'm just going to go to my modifier. Um, Give me one second. Let me just move my settings over here. And I could just go to like my clump over here. There's my clump. There it is. Give me a second. I'm using my mouse, which I don't normally use. So we bring our, the mask was 0.5. And then what did we set the density to, Tran? Uh, it, much lower than that. Was it like 0 0.01 or something? Yes, but your scale is much smaller. To, oh, yeah. So you're, it's going to be different. Something like this. Probably density mask at one again. That looks pretty good. So you can see it looks pretty nutty for now. Uh, and again, we're not gonna make this most amazing thing here. Uh, so I would just come over here and bring up the noise, the noise frequency, and we have to bring up this, oh, not this one, sorry. Our noise scale, just bring this guy up over here. For some reason, the noise values um, in IGS have to be like extreme, they have to be like, 10 or five, which is. Yeah, I think I think I ended up setting it like to, I yeah, think because like, of the scale being so big. Uh, well, it's not the same as yeah. um, the other X gen. So, I mean, let's just move this along here. Again, we're not gonna make this perfect. You can see then I would open up the clumps. I could pull some of this stuff out. Okay. Let's just pull this out here. I'm going to go to my um, descriptions here. And one of the things that I want to do is make sure I bring the taper. That way it comes to a point and then bring this taper start so that it doesn't start tapering from the very beginning, but more towards the end. And I'm going to keep it like this. Okay. And again, face camera, you can see the problem we have here. So let's go back to our description here. I'm going to keep this simple. I'm not going to do all the clumps that we did. I'm just going to do a, a second. Uh, I'm just going to do the noise. Gets the point across, right? Yeah, I think noise, that's good enough. Yeah. Otherwise, this, this whole lesson will be how to make this look good. Yeah. <laughs> So here we're just running the noise. 
Okay. And you can see we're just running this uh, across everything. We could tone down the magnitude. So what we ended up doing on the shocks were two different clumps and um, two different noises. Looks like cousin. Yeah, it looks like cousin it had a baby. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what else can we do here? So if you wanted to bring this down, I think I went too low on the density. I think yes. probably brought, I should have brought this up higher. So can you exceed one? Yeah, let's go to like 0.1.5. But if you wanted to bring it down, you could use the density mask and bring it down if you wanted to do the opposite. Okay. So if you were happy with this, all you would have to do is we would go to our generate, convert interactive groom to polygons. But before doing that, you probably want to fix the face camera problem. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, you forgot. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, but that's the second problem. No, that's the first problem. No, that's the second problem. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so here's here's a big one here. So if we go to our, our, our twist brush, okay, you're going to see that one of the issues we have here, again, with this whole facing camera, you I turn, should turn it off. Yeah, yeah you should turn it so off. So if I turn off the face camera here, so if I go to my settings and I turn on twist brush, uh, there's a setting here called, where is it? Align to surface. Where is uh, am I? Oh, there it is. Align to surface and then press flood. And you can see all the hairs now get twisted to face the camera. Or yeah, or they're aligned to the surface, which is essentially facing the camera, which yeah. is exactly what we want. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for reminding me on that. And then we could go to um, generate, convert interactive groom to polygons. Let me make sure I have this guy selected. Oh, I know, I know what happened. It's because I'm using 2011. All my settings are in 2019. That's why all my settings are weird. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me just let me just adjust this here. So uh, I combine mesh. What else did I do? Uh, insert span along with. I set this to four four. Uh, and I think that was it, right? Curvature. There we go. And there we go. So now we have that. So again, sorry about that. I've been doing everything in 2019. And then for some reason, I'm doing the demo in 2022. Uh, so all my settings that I have not moved are kind of skewy. So you can see now we have our polygons. If you wanted them to get smoother, we could adjust that in our description by going into our CV now. And we could, like I set this to like eight, we would have smoother, uh, less kinked surface. And then you could just bring this in. The problem is if we look at this right now, so let me go to my UV layout. Everything is just one single hair. So what we ended up doing, and this, I'm not going to have my settings saved here. So let me just open my, my settings here because I got it down perfect. So turning off the face camera, um, the, the problem where you would see the hair thinning and unreal where Miguel was showing you, um, you go back into Maya, you turn off face camera on XGen and you make sure that all, then you can see where it's rotated and how it looks thin, um, where you can fix it with the twist brush, making it aligned to the surface and that corrects the problem. Yeah. Um, for us, it's a new thing because hair is not new for us, but hair like 
this way is the way we're using it is different. Um, it's not a problem that we're ever thinking about when we're rendering something because it uh, renders will render hair as a tube, right? So whichever way it's facing is never an issue since it's turned into a cylinder on uh, when it renders. And that's our normal workflow. And again, Unreal is not, you know, is introducing new ways for us to try different workflows. Okay, so this was the setting that seemed to work the best for us. Uh, and we messed with this for like countless hours. So that's why I'm like uh, writing down my notes from uh, my previous settings from 2019. So when I did this, I could just do layout UVs and this is going to take a moment and it's just going to grab all of that hair, relay it out and make it fit inside of a single uh, 4K tile here. That seemed to give us the best results. What we've noticed is when we would change the, let me see if I could rotate scale, I mean a pan up. When, if I turned on rotate shells, which I can't see, oh, here it is, rotate shells, the, time, the processing time would shoot up astronomically. So you can see just doing that, now everything is laid out like this. It's not gonna give a lot of texture space to the hair, uh, but that's fine. Now, if we put any texture on this, you would get some sort of variation on a hair by hair uh, level. You're not going to see fine detail on the individual strand, but as a whole, you would see a lot of complexity. Okay. And then we would just export this. So like if I exported this guy out real quick, so let's go to our desktop. I'll call this furball. And let's just come in here. And let me just open up. I'm just going to open it right here in the main sequence. So we cannot use Nanite. So we'll turn that off and import. Okay, so that's in there. So you can see it comes in pretty quick. You can see my scale was to totally messed up, which is partially why uh, my Maya stuff was acting a little weird. But you can see it comes in pretty quick. Looks great. It just gets weird, which is unfortunate. You could see it thinning out here. And again, here you're seeing it all together, and that's some of the, the big problems we're having. Let me just close this here. Much thinner. This is much thicker, and that has to do with the scale. Um, again, because I just jumped in 2020. Uh, and while we were building all of these shacks, one thing I didn't do that we always do, and I cannot stress this enough, is you should always, this is one of the biggest things I see uh, students do wrong, is never do anything without a reference model for scale all the time. You just have them all over your scene, just everywhere. So you could always remind yourself the scale you're working. So I would never have built this the way I did in Maya without having her in here. And I would have really quickly seen like, oh man, I'm working at a much smaller scale than I thought. So that's uh, one of the main issues we had. The other issue we had, this is really weird here, is if you look at that scene that we showed you earlier that had all the fire, looks freaking awesome. We ended up buying this fire pack from this company called Action VFX. Action VFX is, I swear by those guys, like I love them to death. I think they're, they're amazing. Let me just um, minimize some of this stuff. So when I'm doing like compositing stuff, live action stuff, I'm always using their elements. And um, when I saw that they were doing stuff for Unreal, I bought it like blindly because I know that the quality of their stuff is so good. So they have um, these fire systems available in Cascade and Niagara. 
and you just drag in the blueprint like so. And so that's a tiny fire. And let me bring in a large fire. And you can see that they look pretty great when you look at them like that. Looks pretty nice. Yeah, they look awesome. But you're going to see... Um, You're going to see one of the problems. I'm just reading some of the notes here. Let me see what you guys are saying. Yeah, I'm at the uh, big time. So. Yeah, we know that Unreal 5 has issues, but. Yeah, but it's it's good that everyone, maybe everyone else doesn't know that, yes, it definitely has issues. So We knew going into it, but you still have to know what exactly the problems are. Yeah. So this is not, I mean, it's geometry it doesn't have opacity maps it doesn't have subsurface so we thought so, that would that would be a, a yeah. not so bad yeah not so bad it's just geometry very simple textures um in general it seems unreal has problems with tiny details at a distance yeah <laughs> yeah but here's the other issue so check this out and this ties into um the hair grooms on this guy so you can see these fires you can see this looks like a tiny little fire like you would see it on a barbecue or on a tiki torch or something and this looks like a raging fire, right? So if I come over here to my details, let me see, where are my details? Give me one second. I think my details are in another window. Let me just open the second details. Okay. I don't know why I did that. Details are still not opening. Okay, here they are. Okay, sorry about that. All right, cool. So, and let me go to my... Let's see what else I want here. So, okay, so I have my HDRI here. And you could see that if I set this HDRI to like 0.1, look at the fire. Look at that smoke. <laughs> yeah, look at the fire. Look at the smoke. Look how nice that looks here as it, as it works it out. Yeah. So, yeah. This is my content browser. And look what happens as I bring down the brightness. So a lot of our scenes are dark. So let's say I did something like this, 0 0.01. Okay. And you can see that all of a sudden, this, sm this smoke looks psychotic. It looks like crazy fire, and it's only by making the scene darker. Um, why is my outliner not showing up? There it is. So if I grab my directional light and I set this to be even lower, so let's say 0.2, and let's grab my HDRI backdrop, and I'm going to bring down my skylight to 0.5 all of a sudden these little uh, fires just look crazy so that became a big issue with us and as the scene got darker and darker it just introduced more and more problems for everything so let me see if i could get the um... and you know the fire is like um we want to use it for a nighttime shot, so it has to be dark, right? We don't really want it like a, um, a fire, like when the sun is up and high. Yeah, it which is the purpose. Yeah, it defeats the purpose. Like you want to do like fire at night, right? Most people light fires at night. Um, so then. So we found a workaround, which yeah. I, I'm going to show you in a second. But you could also see that as the scene has gotten darker, take a look at this guy. Like you can see that they're getting really weird, <laughs> right? So, okay, so we looked into our visualize 
and we could see our lumen scene and we could see that there's some stuff going on there. So one of the workarounds that we did still didn't fix the problem is if we selected the fur, come over, let me open up my notes. So it was our, give me one second. There it is. So if I turn off my effect distance field, okay, you can see it turn that off there, turn that off there, turn that off on this guy. It kinda made it better. The problem, and it's basically because it's just completely ignoring um, lumen, I'm assuming because you can see the shape of the fur is no longer there. Whereas when I had it selected and I had effect distance field, you can see that it's creating this. And I'm just, I'm just wondering if this just can't handle all the fine strands of the hair. But anyway, this solved the problem somewhat. So we didn't care if it was perfectly GI accurate as long as it looked good and uh, that solved something so let me come over here so you can see it's a little bit less noticeable yeah it's and still the, there but it's less noticeable and the fur looks pretty good up close um just not so much far away it's all kinds of weird stuff well not all the time up close because sometimes when you get up close that's when you start getting the splotchiness yeah. And that's when we started doing render tests because we're like, is that even showing up in the final render or is that just because of the viewport is moving around? So, yeah. Okay. So there you can see we have these issues with the nighttime. <laughs> I'm going to come back and show you how I worked around uh, the fire in a second, but I'm going to pass it on to Tran because at this point we were like, okay, we need to come up with different types <laughs> of shacks because the fur is problematic. Uh, so while she's doing this, I'm like uh, pressing literally every button in Unreal, reading everything to try to figure out what the hell is going on. And then with this fire, we thought this was going to be the easiest thing. Oh, it's nighttime throwing fire. Fire looks great at night. Well, this is what it looks like. It looks like you threw a bucket of water on a pit of fire. So anyway, so, <laughs> so um, Tran, uh, you take it from there. All right, let me share my screen, make sure. All right, so. Hold on, let me answer a, a few questions really quickly. Here. Okay, sure. So uh, could you apply physics to that fur? Possibly, but we haven't done, like I said, we didn't, haven't done the groom in Unreal. We did all the groom in Maya, exported it as geometry so that you couldn't do it that way. But that's our next thing. You can tie the opacity values. So Sean is saying you can tie. Okay, so we'll try that. Um, let me see what else is here. Okay. So yeah, Tran, if you want to take it from here. Okay. So let's do, I'll take it from here. So, yeah. um, all right. So when we got to figure out that stuff, uh, I just went ahead and started doing stuff, but, um, you know, I also started making some of these huts, too and they you know anyway we still have the same hair problems but i want to go through uh, the but workflow these, these have less fur <laughs> so we yeah. were like let's keep the fur on, on the roof that was our wishful thinking yeah so they have less but there's still some interesting workflows so um, i made these huts first uh and i just want to show some of the process like how i got these materials made now they're not really like what I consider hero props, meaning like something I spend 
a very long time working on and then you can get real close and every detail is perfect and very beautiful. They're really meant to just be kind of far away or like medium shots and out of focus, right? So as long as they kind of look good like this, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Um, the thing I want to go after word is uh, we started making these, these tents, which are much less problematic and we felt they look pretty cool. So first I'll show you my process here with Quixel Mixer because I still, I still pretty sure that we're going to use this um, anyway. And I spent time doing this. So let's just load up Mixer. So Mixer, Quixel Mixer is part of Megascans. So you guys can download this and have this for free for yourself. So let's just say I start with a new mix. Just call it demo. Let's do it at 4K. Just maximize this. Um, so if you have an account online, right, you can search whatever surface you want, um, right? I can look at, you know, soil or whatever, and I can click on something I like that's not soil, it's wheat straw, but I can press download. Once I hit the download button, uh, it should pop up over here. And my local library are uh, basically materials that I do have. So I can start with something simple. I mean, I can do this wood. Let's just load up this one right here. And let me actually, actually, you know, let me jump forward over here to my references, just so you get an idea of why I decided to make this type of stuff. So this is my reference board. Um, and I was looking at these mud huts here, right? Mud walls. And then we have the thatch roof. And then you do have some where there are a lot of logs. And in between, I think, from what I can understand, is that there's mud kind of filling up the gaps between the wood, right? So I was trying to kind of replicate something like that. Let's see. Um, this one's pretty cool. Here you can see the way that they are. Go back structured. to the go back to the one that's this one melting. <laughs> to show the whole thing, it's incredible. Yeah. So you know, looking at the size scale reference, these individual they're not really hair sized. I mean, they're much much larger than that, right? So I'm thinking, okay, let's say we have something like this, and I want to layer in some mud, uh, and I got different types of mud. And you just don't know what you're going to get until you try it out. So let's try this one. So I just double click. It takes a moment to load. Okay, and there we have it. We're going to go under layers. So my first layer was just a log, and then I have this layer. Now, you don't, you know, what's really nice about this program is you don't really need that much experience to pick it up and start using it. As, as long as you have some background 3D, you'll learn it very, fairly quickly. Um, the other thing that does really nice is it's just working on a tileable plane, right? So it's taking up the first UDIM um, space. And as you're working, you never have to worry about it being tileable. It will automatically tile as long as you're using the Megascan textures, right? So there's no bad seam um, at any point while you're, while you're doing this, okay? So here's my cracked mud. Now I can do a couple of things. Um, I have my height. So at zero, it's set you know, to whatever, but I can bring up the mud. And you can see how beautifully it transitions this right here as I'm sliding up and down. There's no ugly, harsh um, seam. Like, you know, you're getting this nice, look at that crack, you know? So there's really great detail. Um, the other thing is you can also change the color. Uh, uh, even bit. if you sculpted that in, like if you sculpted the individual branches and then you did the mud separate, you would always feel like there's a separation. Yeah, you always feel yeah. there's a separation. It's mixing based on the height map, right? So Megascan has a displacement map. And based on that, it's determining how to mix it in, which is partially why it looks so great. You can also grab this and you can tint it, right? So I can say, you know, some of, the, some of our mud in our world is a little bit more red. You can do something like that. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking something like green grass and then trying to make it red or something green and making it, 
you know, or just the wrong color, if you're just shifting it a little bit, it does a pretty good job. So I can do something like, like this. There's no sound. There's no sound. Hello? Hello? Hold on. Let me uh, check. Give me one second. Hello? I can hear myself. Is the sound back? Okay. Yeah, it's back. It's very weird. You guys remind me how long did the count sound cut out for? You guys don't know? Okay, let me just back up a little bit. All right. So I think this is where I left off. So um, like a minute. Okay. So I tinted this and I just pushed this down a little bit. And I want to try a second material because I want to see how I can layer this up. Um, I, it's going through very evenly, naturally, right? So if I want to change how this is going to behave, I can apply something like a noise map. So let me just delete this one. And I'm going to click on this icon where it says add noise layer and it looks all squiggly, right? And then what it does is it gives me varying heights, something like this, and I can adjust the frequency on it. Um, now, you have to be careful. You don't want to make your wood really wobbly, although it kind of works in this strange world. But now because I have deeper pit areas, when I load this up, uh, maybe this is not the best one. Let's try another material here. Let's try this one. Give it a second. Okay, so when I load this one up here, it's going to be affected by this map here, right? So however strong I make it, you can see it's exposing a little bit more. So I'm kind of carefully trying to use this and then readjust some of this stuff here. Now, um, within this map, let's say this one here, I have a lot of high peaks, right? Let's just bring it up. And maybe it's too... Um, exaggerated. So I can do a couple of things. I can change the tiling on this one particular piece. If I go over placement, I have repetition. So I can change it to tile two times, which makes it a little bit smaller. And so maybe that's what I'm looking for. Let's just slide this back down, something like that. And I can have my noise. And you can see how the noise makes a difference, how it's mixing in, right? And of course, I can adjust my noise. I can change my frequency. You can see the little icon. I wish I could see it a little bit larger. Um, but I can change the strength of that. And that will make a huge effect on where this shows up. The other thing I can do here, let's just bring this back up, is I can just look at this and go, I actually want to change, maybe make this a little bit flatter. So I have high frequency right here. I have high frequency, low frequency. So high frequency will... Um, adjust the small details like this. And then the low frequency will, you know, do the big stuff like this, right? So if I just kind of flatten this out a little bit, maybe I'll get a result that I like a little bit more as I'm blending it in with this material, right? And then again, the noise is just giving me like little pits so it comes in a little bit differently. And then I can change this tint here. I can even color pick as a starting point like that, and you can see now it's blending in much more nicely. Let's see. 
Okay, so there's not a question particular to what I'm doing. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to respond to any of that. So anyway, this is a very basic stuff. Um, you can layer, you can also mask other things out. Like, you know, for example, I can look at, and this is a little bit more tedious, so I won't do a good job of doing this, but let's just say I load, you know, this one in here on top. Right, say I have this one. Again, I can change the tiling pretty, you know, easily. Right, and let's just say I like some wood coming in, but not so many. So I can apply a paintable mask like this, and I can just paint it out like that, just to hide what I don't want. Okay. And that's pretty much the gist of it, right? So I kept it pretty simple. Um, and I did a few sheets of these. So once I was done, I just set this to export. Um, you can set your path. I did this much larger. You know, I did this at 8K. Um, and then what I did then, you know, we're getting really nice displacements like this, right? If I turn it off, of course, it just looks like that. So I really want to apply this onto a simple geometry. For example, you know, something like this, uh, whatever shape that I have. So what I do, I'll just do a quick model. In here. Let me just get rid of the ends. So it's not gonna be pretty, but it will kind of demonstrate some stuff. Okay, so let's just say this is like my hut wall, right? You wanna make sure a couple things if you're gonna apply this. One, you better have UVs because it's just not gonna work. It won't be able, this geometry won't be able to read the texture. Alex says hi. And let's just cut this. And I will unfold this. And then the other thing you wanna make sure is that this is straight. Otherwise it will be warped. So let's just leave this kind of messed up. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make it so you understand what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm gonna apply uh, a Lambert very quickly and just apply just the albedo. So it's still gonna look flat, but at least we can see how this is laid out. So give me one second Why I link this. While you do that, Ahmed, I'm actually just reading all the stuff you're saying. So those are good good uh, ideas and techniques. Okay, so here we are. So I have this obviously looking really weird because I need to fix my UVs. So, you know, very quickly, I can use it. I'm just gonna orient this. Okay. And then before I displace it, um, just by looking at this, I can decide how what I want my scale to be, whether I want it larger or smaller. Let's just keep it like this, right? And it's not a properly textured asset. It's crossing over UDIMs and stuff like that, which you, you shouldn't do if you're gonna if it's gonna be a hero piece, but it's not a hero piece. Yeah. So um, okay, so I'm happy with that. Now the other thing you have to do when you prep your mesh is you need to make sure your polygons are uniform, right? Uniform means that they're square because if they're not square, this is gonna displace really jacked up in ZBrush because our polygons are long. So you're gonna have more details vertically, right? And then when it comes to horizontal details, they're gonna be really blobby and weird. Um, if anyone has used ZBrush, you probably have encountered this problem at some point. So all I have to do is just make sure that they look square. Um, and if you don't know what I mean, just do it and someday, you know, you'll remember what I said, <laughs> hopefully. Okay, hold on, let me just export this. Um, and I'll show you the workaround for the fire in, in a minute that we at least think is gonna be our approach. Uh, we'll get into that uh, in a minute. Okay, so once I have that, I've exported this. This is how 
I think this should look. I mean, I don't really think it looks good, but um, just pretend. Let's play pretend. Okay, so let's maximize this. And let me just import this geometry that I just exported. Okay, so I have this. So that's what I have. Let's just turn on, uh, oops, double-sided, because I'd like to see the other side. And I'm just gonna divide this, just double-check my mesh. Okay, it shrunk a lot, but that's another problem. So I'm gonna bring this up this high. I'm not gonna bring it up all the way as high as I usually bring it to. I usually bring it higher, and then I'll decimate the mesh. So then what I do then is I just import my texture. And let me just dig for it. And what I'm importing is the actual height map. So I need to bring in my TIFF displacement. Okay, so that's the height map export our Quixel mixer. Now you do have to flip your textures upside down in ZBrush. So I flip it upside down, make alpha, and then I wanna display it as a displacement. So I have to do a couple of steps. You have to make sure you have a texture and I'm just gonna load this in. And now I don't see it, I have to give it a intensity value, right? So now I can see that. Now, if I look at the sides, you see the silhouette is very flat. So we're not actually seeing displacement. It really looks more like a bump map. Um, in order to, you see what I mean? Um, in order to actually view the displacement, you have to turn on mode, which is actually important because you could be really over cranking this and not knowing it. So, you know, when I think that looks good, I just hit apply. Which it basically is just a bump map up to that point. Yes. Yeah. So once it looks good here, you just hit apply and then I'm, I'm good. You know, the thing that actually takes a while is just decimating it, converting it to nanite and, and that stuff. But this is how I'm getting very quick. I mean, we're, what we're looking for is just fast workflow. Which, which, by the way, I think I think you should talk about that. That that is a workflow for everything. Even though nanite, you could bring in a bazillion trillion polygons. We're still trying to be smarter about it. You, the, the the import times are crazy, regardless. So you want to bring it in through decimation master and reduce the poly count anyway. Even if you look at mega scan stuff, it's all been reduced somewhere. So you should still uh, do it. You probably, do you want to run them through the, that process? Of decimating it? Yeah. It's slow, Just man. like that piece. <laughs> okay. Well, you don't have to press the whole thing. No, it's, first of all, it looks sharp. But as soon as I hit apply displacement, it's probably going to be soft. See, it gets softer. Um, because when it's actually showing it, it's kind of still showing it as if there's like a bump map or normal map. And that's fine. I can leave it soft like this. But I usually want to get it as best as I can. I don't really want to half, half ass it, right? Um, so I usually would divide one more time, but it becomes very slow. We can be hanging out for a long time if we wait for that. So let's just keep it lower. Um, at a million is actually great, right? But what I displace it at is like 10 million, 12 yeah, million. Nothing we ever do is a million. Yes. So we 12, have like 20, 30 million. Yeah, so it goes really high. Yeah. Then what I do is I run, over into Decimation Master, you need to make sure you keep your UVs. Otherwise, this will blow out your UVs. And then when you try to apply the albedo, you can't apply it uh, because there are no more UVs, right? So I just process it like this. Now, when you're when you're like um, trying to process something that's 2 million, it's fast. When you're processing something 20 million, that takes a long time. So I usually try to keep it around 10 million. It's a reasonable waiting time. Um, now, once it's processed, you can set your percentage. So if I set it to 20%, it should reduce this to 20% of this value that's up here, which is close to a million. So I can hit decimate. And right? just to jump in real quick, always make sure you press the keep UV button. Uh, that's so important. So many times I would forget early on to press keep UV. You'd run through this entire process and then you'd be like, oh crap, I just lost <laughs> everything. 
that should be the first thing you do, of course. Yes, the first thing you should do is that. Super important. So I hit, I hit 20%, and you can see it brought the value down pretty low. Um, yes, yes, it will preserve the UVs, as always. Um, there's probably ways to get rid of it by accident, but generally it should keep it. Now, if I don't like that decimation level, I can undo control Z and I can just change this value. I could say I want 40%, right? The, um, it doesn't take long to actually decimate it. What takes long is just to process it initially when I press pre-process this current thing. Um, once I'm happy with this, I then will export it. Now, the one extra step, you don't need to hit undo anymore. Thanks, Jared. That's nice to know. Um, I, I don't mean that sarcastically. I'm going to test that out next time. Um, when you export it, it has hard normals. And if you bring hard normals into Unreal, it looks terrible, right? So right now, what, the extra step is bringing it into Maya and softening the normals and then exporting it so that it can read soft normals out of ZBrush. But that is how I'm just doing the basic geometry. Now, this method is right now just for the walls, but there's other things that I'm thinking about as far as what I can get from here. So, you know, um, the walls are, are limited, but I'm thinking I can also do things like, you know, mix, let's just say we have soil and it, it looks really nice, um, but now I want a puddle of water, right? So I can just create water and have something like that. But you can see it's just going through it. But if I, as soon as I give it some noise here first, liquid which which is something we definitely want to do on our floor is add a lot a lot of puddles yes even though we're trying to make the area look like a desert but basically if it looks cool it's in our film that's that's our rule <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but i can add water say something like this um it's very different without the noise so the noise actually helps because it remember everything is mixed by height right so as long as you create dents and um, pits, like what this noise does, it gives me this pit here, right? I can now have liquids. So there's all kinds of stuff. And I'm probably going to be using this. Um, we're going to use this to get certain effects for this. Sean is saying, have you tried displacing a mesh in UE5? Uh, no. I didn't. Wait, we did. We did. That's not true. Have... We did. And it, it the, the quality was never the same as displacing it in yeah, yeah. ZBrush is, you know, ZBrush is ZBrush is king. king yeah. King of that. Um, it will have a 20 million poly thing and it will fly um, and do all kinds of magic stuff. Yeah. So that's how I did that. Now, let's, should I move on to how I did tents? Well, let me show. Or you let, want to show some yeah, stuff? Yeah, let me, let me show okay. the fire stuff and then, then you could, you could, uh, yeah, take let's it. just jump back to that. So how the hell do I do this? Um, share your screen. Am I not sharing it? No. I was sharing it. Oh, now you are. Um, well, now you're not. There you are. There we are. Okay. All right. So this is the solution for the fire that we have found. And I'll first show it here, and then I'll show it in the, the wide city shot. So... The thing about CG lighting, especially for some of you guys that are there that are saying you're cinematographers, like I, I come from, well, I come from CG background that then got into cinematography and then went back into CG. So I like to, when I think about lighting, I like to naturally think about, you know, physical lights and physical lenses and physical cameras. And the solution that we came, that I came up with for this was just like, okay, what if, we just don't try to light everything so so low. Like for example, if I'm coming here and I'm setting, I'm going to my um, HDRI backdrop. Like when you look at some of these settings that I have here, if I'm trying to make it moodier, it's like 0 0.003 for the intensity. So maybe I'm going way too low on these values to try to get the look that I want. So what I ended up doing on this time is I'm like, okay, let's come in here and I'll go to my create. I'm going to go to my uh, visual effects. I'm going to go to my post-process uh, volume. And again, sometimes you're going to see me like a deer in headlights because, you know, I, I am totally 
freaked out about the fact that there's a camera pointing at my face <laughs> right now. So I forget everything. If you ask me my name, I probably forget. I just, it does, this doesn't come natural to me. So, all right. So, so this is what, what I'm doing here. First thing I'm going to go to is the auto exposure. Uh, so let me just go to exposure. And uh, let me see. Where is my auto exposure? Okay. So my metering mode, the default right now is auto exposure histogram. I'm going to set it to manual. Okay. And what I like about this is that it's just going to behave like a real world uh, camera. So let me see if this is turning on. So yeah. Okay. So you could see everything just goes black. Okay. So first of all, you need to make sure that we have our infinite bounds turned on, which is super important, which I didn't have on, on the copy that I just had there. So that just means, hey, everything gets affected the same. Okay, so I have this thing turned on. So that's fine. And again, that's under my auto exposure, metering mode manual. So at least now I'm gonna set everything up like a cinematographer, right? So if I come over here to my this, this drop downs are so crazy. So let me just bring some of this down. Chromatic aberration we'll get into later. Okay, and then we get to these guys here, which are my babies here. So my first thing is to just set this up like a real camera so I can think logically in, in my mind, right? Like what the hell is any of this crap? So shutter speed is, you could see, one dash of a second. So your shutter speed should always be for film, for film camera should always be double the speed of your frames per second. So 48th of a second, okay? Sometimes you'll see this, like in V-Ray, you could set it into uh, durations or angles, which is 40, 1 48th of a second or 180 degree shutter, which is half of th uh, 360, which again, is kind of the same here. It's just double uh, shutter speed or half the the entire um, iris sh uh, shutter. So 48th of a second. Okay, that's good. So now this is behaving like basically every film camera in the world, except for movies like Collateral, like Michael Mann movies, that have a high shutter speed. Okay, next up we go to our ISO. So an, a red epic has a native ISO of like 800. So I'm going to say, hey, it's a $50,000 camera. I'm going to go with a, a native ISO of 800. So now I'm grounding my digital camera into a real world scenario in, in a way that I could understand. And immediately you could see, hey, this fire is starting to look much better than the you know water on top of the barbecue look that it had before. Okay. Next up is our aperture, okay? The aperture, aperture is the value that when you didn't know about cameras and your friends told you, oh, if you buy a, a Nikon camera pack at Best Buy, the lens is crappy and you would just nod, but you had no idea what the hell they meant, but you were like, yeah, 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 it's a crappy lens. The lower the aperture speed is usually means the better quality of the lenses, right? Certain lenses, they usually, like the 50 millimeter lens, you could find it at a low aperture, low f-stop for an affordable price. But this value is the difference between an expensive lens and a cheap lens. And you'll often hear it referred to as a fast lens versus a slow lens, okay? Fast meaning the lower this number gets, the faster it is, the higher that number gets, the slower it is. So if you Google Nikon uh, starter kit, most likely you're going to get a camera that has like a 2.8 or 3.5 to 4.8 kind of range, which is considered a slow lens. Just so this all makes sense, the lower this number is, the more sensitive it is to see things at, at night, okay? So the lower this number gets, two things happen. You see more things at night and you have a more shallow depth of field uh, right away. So I'm going to set this 
to an aperture of 1.4. I could still adjust this in my sequencer, but if I, if I start with a 1.4, I'm gonna start with the lenses that I own. I own Zeiss lenses, good lenses from Germany. So again, now I have, I have a red Epic. So I, uh, ISO of 800, I could wrap my mind around it. F-stop at 1.4, I could wrap my mind around it. Shutter speed, 1 48th of a second, I could wrap my mind around that. Maximum aperture, so 2022 20, is about right, okay? So higher the, the f-stop goes, the more everything is in focus. So if you've ever seen like miniature photography, which I was, I was fortunate enough to do uh, some miniature work while I was working for Phil Tippett, um, you want to shoot miniatures with a very high f-stop so that everything appears in focus, okay? The problem is, it's, it's basically the iris. The lower the number gets, it means, which is super uh, counterintuitive, the, the smaller the aperture gets, it means the higher the aperture speed. And then the more open it gets, it's the f-stop in reverse. So 1.4 means more light comes in. An F22 means less light comes in. Okay, so we have that. And then the number uh, of diaphragm basically just means, you know, is it basically the shape of your uh, your aperture. So this to me doesn't matter, eight, six. I kind of like facets, so I'm going to go with like six or, or five. Uh, so something like that. Okay, And right away you can see that the fire looks good but again everything else in my scene is now super dark the pro the good thing though is like if we go back to our hdri you can see that my intensity is set to 0 0.03 now if i set it to one or even if i set it to two well i'm gonna go with one i still get that low you know end of the day kind of vibe to it but the fire looks perfect, right? Then I could also go to my directional light. And if I wanted to, I could tone this down and everything looks exactly how I would expect it to look from a physically accurate photographic point of view. The minute I turn off that post-process volume, you're gonna see water on the barbecue. You're gonna see the fire gets crazy. Uh, I get that uh, f-stop, the HDRI, set it to 0 0.003, which is what we had before. <laughs> it looks so bad. Water on the barbecue. That's exactly what it looks like. And I just thought you can start seeing the card. Like, you I start feel like, seeing the cards, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's aside from that, you see the cards, and you really don't want to see the cards. Yeah, so. I can't be begin to tell you how stressed out this thing got us this week. I was like, what the hell is going on? And, you know, we don't we don't know Unreal that much. So we're figuring out all this stuff as we go. And the more that I could work in a way that makes physical sense to me, the better. And that's how we got this to work. So you could see if I come over here to the city shot. So let me see. Um, I believe this is it. This is not it. Oh, there it is. Okay. And I'll hide all my things here. You can see the fire looks really pretty. However, if I come over here and I turn off my post process volume. You can see it's a completely different scene. It looks terrible. <laughs> the post-process volume for me is compositing. And uh, at I mean, first I just saw it like, oh, it's a compositing thing. But now I realize if you're trying to do moody lighting, at least for us, again, we're figuring this, this thing out as we go. Um, that's the only way that we could get the fire and everything to look good 
is by treating this for, like a physical camera. So basically lighting brighter and then darkening it with the post process, uh, but still maintaining the physicality of a real lens that gave us a good effect. Uh, thank you for the compliments on the city. I promise you this thing is going to look a million times better. Yes. Um, <laughs> like, like, like I, we said earlier, we would never show this at this stage. Uh, we suffered for like an hour before, basically if you guys tune in every week, just know that the hour before you tune in is us going. Wah! <laughs> So, so like, this looks like shit. Yeah. Oh, we can't. Oh, I can't say that. This looks terrible. We can't show this. This yeah. is embarrassing. What do we have to show? So, yeah. um, but it's not, it's really not abnormal, even when we were rendering in a VFX pipeline to experience more noise and more issues when the scene is very dark. Um, and we did notice here, it seems like if you light dark, if you light um, dark, not doing it with Miguel's technique, there is more noise problems. A so lot of there's so a lot Tyson, of yes, yes, the, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of crazy noise problems when you light dark. So what he's doing is lighting bright and then fixing in post process, which is kind of like what we would do in a normal pipeline, where if we have a very dark scene, we light it brighter and then we darken it in post uh, because then we have less noise. Shadows tend to always carry more noise so but, but just yeah. just so, just so, so it doesn't seem like we're doing this crazy thing we're setting the camera the post-process uh, effects to behave like a completely flat line camera right just standard 800 iso that's not like a sony camera just a regular normal decent camera a good lens we're setting everything 148th shutter speed so we're treating everything like a good camera. So we're not really lighting brighter. We're kind of, the way I see it is we're lighting realistically. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I don't know the terminology. I just look at it and go, hey, it's brighter and it's darker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, so Tran, if you want to take the tents here, but I just thought that that, that this thing, I want, like, we want to go back and um, review even like the, the evil hole. The, the devil's butt hole because we feel like with this technique we could probably get it to look better and this is an hdri of uh which we got um uh, by the way oh wait one one last thing from from a from a lighting point of view so this is all being lit with just a very simple setting so we have our hdri we have uh our hdri affecting our skylight you can see I didn't organize this that well before. So I have it in my HDRI. I, I put it back into the skylight and I'm bringing up the intensity quite a bit in the skylight. So th that's one of the things that confused the hell out of us when we were starting to do the lighting in Unreal is we just, we're used to V-Ray. You put the HDRI, HDRI does what HDRI does. Here, it's like, the lighting of it and then like the secondary bounce kind of comes into the skylight. So even though our regular HDRI setting is set to 2.1 in our skylight, we're cranking it up like our secondary bounce, I guess what it is. I don't know what the hell you would call this, but we're cranking that up um, to like 15. And that's what's giving us this like overcast light. So that's doing that. Then we have a directional light, which is basically matching the direction of the sun. And that's what's giving us like this nice rim light, this golden hour light. And then we have the little flame torches, which are not really doing much effect. So there's spotlights, which I have to figure out how to get them to flicker, which I still haven't figured out. But these guys would all flicker. And you can see we're just placing these little uh, lights all over the place to make it feel like a primitive uh, city. So again, we're going to have a big thing in the center here. Some, you know, the city hall, the clock tower. Uh, and we want to have more bridges and stuff like that. Um, these torches, we're going to make nicer torches. Uh, we want to have, we want to have like a, 
a bunch of extras everywhere. So we just need to do a million extra. So if any modelers out there want to help us, uh, just send me a message. <laughs> you get paid absolutely nothing, but uh, I'll buy you a beer one day. So, all right. So Tran, if you want to take over. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me share. One second. Is it fog? It's exponential height fog. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm, I haven't used, um, I haven't used fog cards on this scene, but I probably will. Uh, I am using some of the smoke from the fire. Like you can see back here, up here on the top, right? I'm using it just to separate the values. So if you look over here, so I actually grabbed the fire and I stuck it into the ground, but the particle smoke came up, but it was enough to separate the valleys of the tent. And we'll probably do that throughout the scene. We're probably going to rework this, like the ground and everything. We want to fix the puddles, but yeah. Yeah. Initially we don't have anything. So we just, you're just throwing stuff around. Uh, and as you're doing that, you go, Oh, that doesn't look bad. Let's fix this section. Or, um, you're just making stuff, right? So sometimes the props to make, I think are going to work out in the scene. They do. And sometimes they don't, but that's all part of the process, right? You're, this works, that doesn't work. It's like, oh, wouldn't this be a great idea if we had this? And you start coming up with new ideas as you're filling in this stuff. So another big thing for us is we do not want to light this like an animated film at all. This thing is violent as hell. We want this to be, feel like a live action film that just has pretty characters that are animated. So we could, you know, so maybe some kid will watch it one day on YouTube and be traumatized for life <laughs> and then be inspired to come to Noman. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So go try. All right. So I want to jump over to, um, what I was doing here. So I wanted to make these tents, right? So that's the final, Product. You have to share your screen. Oh, I don't have my screen shared. There we are. Okay. So these guys, you know, this guy ultimately decided, like we put in the scene, it, it's kind of funny looking, so we're probably not going to use it. At least I don't want to use it. because We called it the TQ room. <laughs> yeah, because it was like, yeah, not really correct. So we're like, okay, let's just try making some, some tents. And Miguel was like, let's do like TP shapes. And I'm like, well... TP shapes, can't they look too, like, you know, like wrong, right? So we had um, this thumbnail here, um, which we both liked these ideas. Uh, I, you know, look at references. That's Mongolian. Um, this is from Harry Potter. I don't really, I don't really want the tents to look like this. And I didn't really want them to look Native American. So, you know, it's, I, I, well, that's all I know. I want to feel more like these references here, um, but not exactly that because it's still in our own style. So what did I do? I usually don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I usually go, okay, here's a shape. Um, and I make a block out shape. And I think I want to make this marvelous because marvelous will simulate the cloth and it will look really, really nice. Right. And then I think about how am I going to do this in marvelous? Uh, there's a lot of ways you can do this in Marvelous. So the way I approach it is not the absolute way you can have your own approach. My approach uh, might not be the best approach, but it worked out for me. For So it was fine. Um, as far as how you could approach it, you could build the scaffolding, right? You could do, make it very physical. So I could build like actual like um, structure, like a frame, right? Made out of these logs and simulate cloth on top and, you know, Marvelous will do that because it's, that's what it's good at. But it's actually really, really tricky to do that. It would take a very long time because it would probably slip off the, the frame constantly and poke through the frame. Um, so what I did instead was like, no, let's just work with this. So I made this. And then let's jump into Marvelous. And I'm going to import this mesh. Let's see. Actually, that's the wrong one. Let's do this again. Cloth. 
Okay. Okay, so I bring this in here. Now, again, this is just the technique that I thought was the easiest. And it also gave me a way to come up with a style that I think is stylized, but um, was good because it looks a little bit different. So I can try to just draw, like put cloth and drape it on top. Um, but it's kind of really, you know, you would just be kind of fighting it. So if, let's say I made something like this. And it's going to show up over here. And I could try, you know, doing this and sewing it. But I think that there would be all kinds of problems just trying to make it fit, you know. And it might not be the right right shape. And I can see myself doing this like most of the time. Right? So I was like, I don't want to do that. Let's just try to avoid that. So what I did instead was I used the line tool, right? and use the line avatar. This is an avatar. And what I did is I just drew a shape like this. And I cut it into sections, trying to line up my points. Now here, I can go to flatten and it will create a piece of cloth. Now the problem is, you got to mouse over just right, okay? You have to wait till it turns blue, and then I don't know when it's going to, oh, there we are. Then you click it. But anyway, I, you know, you fiddle around with that. So once I click it, I press Enter, and then it pops up. So now I have this piece, and that was pretty fast. Um, and I can just create multiple pieces like this. Just checking my time. This is probably not going to turn out very well just because we're low on time. And I'm going to just copy these. So I'm going to try to move quickly, which is probably good for your attention span anyway. Let's grab this control paste. I usually have a little bit of um, sensitivity control in this program. Like, it's a little fussy. Okay, so now I have all these here. I can just sew these pieces. Now, this is not where it gets interesting or strange. Let's do free sewing. Let's click here. And I'm sewing these two together. You can see the seams popping up over here. So those are the stitching. Oop, that one's weird. Okay. And then the stitch over here. All right, the other thing I'm gonna do very quickly is I'm just gonna lower my resolution. Um, I'm gonna lower it by increasing this number. It will simulate much faster. Let's just hit the sim button. And you can see it's actually wrapped around this pretty well. Now here, what I'll usually do is tug at this, which I didn't wanna spend all this time doing this. That's why I did it this way. Um, had I done it with a frame, I would be doing that a lot. And I'm just going to pin these so it doesn't slide down. Because as you continue to simulate, you can have this slip off and just end up, you know, where you don't want it to be. Okay. So I would have these. And then what I do is I just look at the points I want to place, trying to pull this out. It's pretty much the most incredible program. Yeah, it's pretty ever. amazing. Yeah. Now, I'm going to place points. So I'm going to mouse over in order to get this kind of look. 
where you can see that they are pulled out as if they're pulled out by um, the these, tension. Yeah, the tension. So I don't have it simulating. When it's not simulating, it's actually quite fast. And I'm just going to place them, I'm going to hold W and click where I think they're supposed to be. I can kind of see the seam. Um, I'm not doing it that's careful. Normally, I want to be at the edge of my cloth. I'm just rushing through it. And let's do one here. Now, when I have those points, I can click on them. I'll get this gizmo, and I can just pull them out. They're not simulating right now. I actually prefer to do this before simulating because um, it feels really slow to pull it. And I can also be pulling it in as I'm, as I'm doing it. I can't do all these points at once. And if I do it while it's simulating, it can just um, kind of pull the whole tent in one direction that you don't really want it to go in. So I feel that if I just kind of do this before simulating, they're going to pull evenly across. So there won't be any weird stuff that I'm not looking for. OK, so anyway, that's something like that. And then I'll just sim. OK, now this doesn't. This gives me a shape, which is cool. But it doesn't give me um, the wrinkles. So I thought about how I was going to do that. And I thought the easiest way of doing this is I'm just going to select this. And I'm just going to layer this with another piece of cloth. So I'm going to have this piece be really nice and smooth. But I don't want it smooth, right, um, ultimately. Um, but I'm going to layer by doing a layer clone over. Hold on one second. It's Marvelous Designer, Dyson. Yeah. So layer clone over, which actually now has a second piece on top. So there's actually two pieces here. Now, this is going to be, this is the same exact size, so it won't contribute anything. But I can take these sheets and make them larger. So I have my weft, uh, my shrinkage weft and warp. They're both at 100. 100 means 100%, right? So if I set it to 80%, um, these will scale to 80% of, of what they are here. So what I want to do is set them larger so they got 110, so 10% larger, right? Um, and simulate. And actually, let's darken some of this fabric here. And it starts to go slow. You can feel this delay. And I'm just going to darken this because white is actually hard to see. And I lower the roughness, which makes it kind of shiny, but I can see my wrinkles. OK, so there's not a lot of change here. So let's just exaggerate and just do 120. And also, my density of my mesh is probably not detailed enough. So if I take a look at my actual um, mesh here, yeah, there's not a lot of topology. So there's only so many wrinkles I can get with what I have, right? So I have to lower this number. And as I lower this number, this will make the mesh denser. OK. So I just start getting this look. Um, and it's not magically going to it. It actually, I think it actually looks kind of bad. <laughs> so, but um, you know, I just mess around with this. I mean, the thing about it is, it's gotten easier in a way. But then you have to start thinking like a seamstress, which is not easy. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of um, anyway, this is how you can see I'm getting these 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 wrinkles. They look a little weird. But um, most, a lot of people have problems learning this program because people learning this program have background 3D. So like sometimes you go, oh, you know, hey, I want to make this thing. You're like, well, you know how to do it in Maya. You know how to do it in ZBrush. The problem with Marvelous is you have to learn how to sew. So you have to learn pattern making, right? So if learning this program technically is not a very difficult program, um, but the struggle for me and most people I know is like, we need to buy pattern books. We need to figure out how now you're thinking of like a, a completely different career path and, and that's a completely different art form. So that's where the struggle is. And some people take to pattern making better than other people. So, yeah, um, I like this type of stuff. So I take to it more easily, but anyway, so this is how I would get something like that. And I, Pretend that the wrinkles look good. Um, and I would just export this piece, right? Um, you can get UVs in here. 
I don't really want to UV it after the fact. So I lay it out in here. It kind of pops around all over the place like that. But I just lay it out. And then I will get something that I can texture in inside a substance. The UV mapping is actually really easy because you're already working in two dimensions with the, the patterns. Yes, this is actually the best. Um, I think Marvelous produces the best UVs because it replicates how it would be in in real life, right? So all you, all you have to do is just lay them on top, make sure they're not on top of each other, not yeah. overlapping. Just don't break the rules. You don't actually have to unfold anything because this is how it would be in real life, right? In real life, you would have cut these sheets exactly in this shape and you would have sewn it together. And however, uh, the textile lays on top of it would be real. So that's how it would be. Yeah. So that is that. And let me just stop that there. And then what I would do next is bring into substance, which is, you know, right now, this is a lot of this. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is our process. And, you know, I worry about it getting repetitive. Uh, but what I would do here, let's just say, let me open a file. Okay, so this is one of my tents. So when I'm texturing this stuff, I'm always thinking about how can I streamline this? Um, the first one is usually longer. And at this point, I can make a lot of tents really fast now, but not initially. So the first thing you wanna do, this is a very completed file, is you wanna bake mesh maps, right? So the mesh maps will give you important data like curvature, um, details, and ambient inclusion, things like this. And based on that, you can just procedurally apply, you know, with that information, dirt and stuff like that. Uh, what I did initially was just throw in different fabrics, right? So I like this one, and I also like this one. This one's this one was a mega scan one. This one is a substance source material. So. Um, I have an account for all that stuff. And this was just color corrected. So initially it was this. So if you look at Megascan, you'll find something exactly like this and it's just fixed. And then I have a mask, right? So now I can dictate based on this where I wanna place this material. So it's actually really fast. So let's just say, let's just set this to a black mask. Okay. And right now I have nothing. Um, I would just go into create a paint node into my mask, right? And I use this tool here, which will automatically fill something white, which saves me a lot of time because I can spend a lot of time painting white like this. And, you know, it catches up on you <laughs> to, to do that. And then you can see I'm painting out of the lines and making a mess. So instead of doing that, what I do is use this tool and go over into this mode and it will just fill in 3D, you know, whatever I want. And so I'm just doing this quickly, right? Um, and again, you know, I am thinking about workflow. So with a couple of taps, I have that. I also have this other piece of cloth in my setup, even though I'm not using it on this one, just in case I want to use it. So I have all my cloth language set down here. Um, this one's set to be more orange. And then again, it has the same thing. So I very quickly just color that. Um, the next thing I do is I want to add extra wrinkles. So this is actually a normal map. Let's look at this. All it is is a normal map, right? You can see it. And it's called uh, paper. It's just crumpled paper. And it works really well as a trick to overlay on top of cloth to add extra wrinkles. And I have two of them, two different ones layered on top. 
So now it feels much more realistic and much more believable, right? So, and then here I have some color correction and then paint patterns. So I have up to red paint. Uh, we have three palettes, three colors, white, yellow, and red. That's the look. And now I just have dirt. Now dirt is pretty easy because we did the bake mesh maps. So if I have something like some dirt I wanna fill in here, and I put in a generator, I can throw in a mask such as this. And this generator reads those maps I baked out, right? And so now it knows automatically, I don't have to paint this stuff, where to apply all the dirt and whatever it is I'm looking for. Um, in this one here, if we break it down, let's get out of this wireframe mode. I have the same thing, right? So now I have dirt like this, but you don't want dirt like this because it's super smooth. So you just break it up, right? So that it feels more broken, right? And then what I also have in my last one is it's forcing to apply dirt like this. And this is really, this is procedural, meaning I don't have to paint it. So if I put in um, this mask, I'm doing it from scratch, right? And I can use, a, this is the wrong one, mask editor, position gradient. You can see it would just read. And I can slide this and go, okay, wherever it's white is where my dirt's gonna show up. So something like that, right? So that's what I have set up here. And it's being broken up with a secondary texture on top. It's like a cavity map, but it's it's reading the height of the model. Yes, it's not. It's not a cavity at all, actually. It's it's just masking out the model based on height. Yeah. Yeah, it teaches, I do one whole lesson on during my class and it takes the whole, lesson just doing this <laughs> this guy so it's you know it's very it could take a long time yeah tran teaches and Tra tan teaches this exact thing in her texture what is texture two yes but texture i two class. um don't teach how to do this tenth but i teach how to how do you use this thing this program yeah, yeah. and it's um i know it's super confusing at at Noman, of course and then now the next step next layer is this last dirt which just what it does is it actually looks it at the the normals. So when we look at our norm map here, um, you can see the cloth has areas where, you know, the fabric grain, right? Um, what this one actually does is it reads the grain and is automatically mapping it into the crevices so that it feels believable. Once I'm done with this, what I then do is create a smart material, which I'm gonna rename this as demo, like this. And I create smart material and it will pop up in a second. This is where it gets really incredible. Right, so it's right here. Now, what I can do, um, it won't apply everything perfect, but let's just say I, I blow this away. Um, it won't apply the hand paint and stuff, but all the stuff that as long as I work procedural, it will apply it. So she brought in a completely different tent. Yes. So I can bring in a different tent and drag and drop this on top and it will have that behavior. Everything except for the hand painted stuff. Yeah, because so, the hand painted stuff is not going to line up to this. It's a different model. Yes. So this is my first one. When I applied it, I just dropped it in like that. And you can see I got it like a nice look, except for all the painted stuff. So all the painted stuff is the, you know, the actual paint patterns. But you can see like this actually works pretty well. And then the other things I have to change very quickly are like what types of textile I want where, right? And again, because I'm trying to think of it a certain way, it's actually fast. Um, had I done my UVs a different way, and like had them all sewn together and or or whatever it would not be this fast because i'm using marvelous uvs and i'm keeping each one of these shapes separate intentionally um it's super fast for me to just say hey uh you know let's make this one let's make this one yellow and now you know they should be those colors like do this one 
here. Right, and it will give me, it will just fill whichever one I want. So that's, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. that's the pipe. That's a pipeline that we have for our our tents. And that and that fabrics. this this pipeline, we did the same thing last week when we were talking about like the hole. As I kept changing the UV layout of the of the hole, I felt like traditionally you'd be like shit you have to start from zero again but by saving these uh smart materials even though i was completely changing the uvs i could just grab something else complete as far as it's concerned it's a completely different model like in some cases it was a completely different model it wasn't just the uvs because the whole the type of decimation was different so it was a different model and i would just throw the smart material on top and everything was this it looked exactly the same except for again the hand painted stuff so if you have to mask a certain area by hand very custom that won't do but everything else you just did it so yeah super powerful yeah do you want to share something on your end? yeah i mean you we're almost out of time but i guess i'll just go through this real quick you know we kind of talked about this but i just wanted to show like the different uh lights here, how we set this up. So um, first thing, the first thing when, when we're lighting something is just always light from the back to the front, right? So when you're starting CG, one of the first thing you want to do is, oh my God, I spent all this time doing this awesome model. I want to put a spotlight right on it, right? But that's not, that's never what you should do. <laughs> You and it, it goes so against what you want to do as an artist because you want to showcase your thing. But the fastest way to make your art look boring is to light it from the front. So I always start lighting from the back to the front, right? The front being the last thing that I light. So first thing I have is just my um, HDRI backdrop, right? So we have this. Right. You can see it looks like broad day. And again, this is we're doing that post process volume. So I'm going to put that in right away because I never lit like this. Once I had the post process volume uh, set, I was always working like this. So you can see as far as this is concerned, it's nighttime. But if I turn off that post process volume, it's an overcast day in Vancouver, right? It's completely different. Uh, so this is how I'm starting. The brightest point, the furthest away from camera. Always, 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 right? So that's back here. So next thing is I want to make sure that I have my directional light, which is just a single uh, directional light, coming in from the direction of the sun. And that was tinted uh, a warmer color. So you can see that's just something like this, a golden hour kind of color kept the values at like 25. So now that looks pretty nice. Okay. Uh, a big thing is your exponential height fog. Okay. Exponential height fog is what's giving us that atmospheric look. And for some reason, uh, everything that we do tends to have a bluish purple tint to it. <laughs> it's yeah. not intentional. We just can't get away from it. Uh, so it always has a little bit of that. And that exponential height fog is really coming together by turning on the volumetric fog. So you just have to turn this setting on. So this is over here. Okay. And we're keeping the values. You can see pretty low, but it's giving us that um, atmospheric perspective. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind or to notice is that I have like noise. So you guys might be seeing that as like compression, but there is noise being added grain in the post-process volume and a little bit of chromatic aberration just to get that sharpness down. Okay, so we have that. So next thing is we went, like I, like I showed you guys earlier, and we used those um, fire elements. So this is uh, the ultimate fire pack volume one from action VFX. 
even if you don't do Unreal, like Action VFX is, uh, they're just the best. So, and they have a subscription thing for like their elements, which I'm subscribed to and, and I love them. So you can see how easy it is. You could just throw in a fire element. We could increase the size of it. We could increase the brightness of it. Um, we could increase the turbulence. So you can see it's going much faster. I didn't even see how far I could push it. But you can see it's going much faster there. Okay. Our size, we could bring it down. Now, you, you only want to take it down or up so much because at a certain point, if you want to scale it up much bigger, well, fire takes on a different look. So you would use like a medium fire, right? You want to do um, large fire. We have this. Okay. So you can see each one of these. If I scale this guy up, the little guy, to this size, it's a very different look. So I'm going to get rid of that guy. I'm going to get rid of that guy. I'm going to get rid of that guy. So first thing was, okay, let's populate this scene with where we want these little fires to go, okay? The fires are playing two roles. One is to give us a little light. They're not actually casting any light. I mean, they technically are, but it's very, very, very subtle. But it gives you detail, right? They are emitting like little embers in the whole thing, which is pretty cool. But you could see it's not casting a light, so the scene looks cool here. I actually like that, but it's it needs a little bit more uh, more kick. So that's where you go in and you start putting in um, spotlights to get the effect that you want. And again, we're gonna have a flicker effect on this, but like we we literally got to this point like thirty minutes before. Like we put this last tree in like. 10 minutes before the stream started or 20 minutes before. Okay, so you can see we're just going in there and trying to light stuff. But even as we light it, like even this tent, you could see we're lighting it from the back. It's, it's not about showing the object. It's about having a clear separation of values as you go into Z depth, right? So that's why we have this rim light there. So, okay, now I could read that and separate it from... The floor here i can now make out that shape okay so then we could go in and start putting another one so you could see this one over here is helping to bring out some of these branch details and this one you could see like why would i put a fire element there if you don't even see the fire it's because i'm using the the smoke to separate the values and that's good enough for me okay so some of these lights are going to be super subtle. So I'm just going to go through some of these and see what we get. So you can see some of these are very much in the distance. Just to give the illusion of the light coming from the actual uh, fire pits. And again, we'll have a flicker on them. So you can see the watchtower. Okay, so back up on the top there, just giving it a little bit of detail. And you're we're never over lighting it. Very little, letting things fall into shadow. And then this guy here, which is our foreground, you could see we just put the, I think this is one of the only like blue lights, just enough to pick up some of the highlights, but not overly illuminate the entire scene. If you over illuminate this, it just becomes extremely boring as we saw with um, this thing here. Like you look at that, you're like, yeah, it's cool. There's a lot of detail, but it doesn't have a tone to it. It just looks like daytime, cool huts, uh, where this, you're like, oh shit, if you walked in to this thing, you'd be like, oh my God. Uh, this is beautiful, but scary, and someone could eat me. So um, that was that was the the goal here. Then we have a, a moving camera because we always try to get our our stuff into like shot form. 
So we have it in sequencer. So we could start seeing what the camera is going to do. And you could see we're trying to introduce a foreground element uh, even closer to camera. And we'll probably put something else uh, closer to camera, but um, all, we're always thinking about three clear layers of depth or so our background, which we do not have our centerpiece yet, uh, our midground, which is all of this stuff. And then our foreground object is like, you know, this is the end of the day after the hunt. You're going to have our girls, uh, Ala and Koa, arriving with their father to the village. So this is the shot. You would see this. Camera rotates to the side. Our three principal characters walk into frame, and that's it. So, um, you know, I think we jumped around a bit with the lighting stuff, so I hope it wasn't too confusing. Um, a lot of it, a lot of this stuff, like, like we've said, is stuff that we we literally figured out in the past day especially the um, treating it more like a physical camera so so yeah does anybody have any questions for us let me see i'm not looking at the chat yeah i mean you don't even have to render it a viral 30 minutes before class like that's what's so <laughs> amazing is like this is it like there you go like that is that is the render, you know, it, it, it really just bogs the mind. When oh yeah. You're doing it blows this. my mind. It blows my mind to see fire, uh, blows my mind to see like, had, had we been doing this the traditional way, it would have taken so much longer to get to this point. Um, just to like, I think the modeling would, well, one, I can't model this way. Like the way I'm modeling is like kind of technically really dirty, um, for a normal pipeline. We, you know, it takes more time. You have to do clean models. You got to do displacements. And then uh, to even try to lay out all this geometry and light it, man, this would take a long, this would be a long time. This would take a long time. A I very, mean, very long time. We built this entire city in a week while we're, while we're learning Unreal. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, they should be pre-doing pre their movies. You know, the thing about it is if you were a cinematographer, and you encountered all this stuff that we had to deal with this week, you'd be like, screw this. Like, what do you mean, uh, you know, you have to do this or that or that or that. Once it's explained to you, it makes total sense. But troubleshooting this stuff, you know, it it it, it would make someone who doesn't have a technical brain lose their mind. <laughs> um, there's another question. Do you have any plans to add any map paintings? Uh, I don't know. Are you volunteering? De Devin Rush. <laughs> so Devin Rush is one of my all-time favorite students, one of the best students we've had at Noman. So uh, if you volunteer, we might. So you let me know. We pay nothing and you work hard hours. <laughs> so uh, we'll make the final project. Fog would take, yes, fog would yeah. take a long, long, long time. Devin? Oh, Devin, Devin says you're doing it. He's a... Uh, yeah. All right. So I'll go back and change your grade, give you an A++. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll talk about that later. So, yes, fog would kill you. Here, it's nothing. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay. So things we're going to do next week, our goal is to keep uh, getting this village to look pretty good. Uh, the models are being rigged right now. So once we have our two main characters rigged, we're going to do a bunch of uh, villagers using the exact same topology. Uh, they would have all the same, the same blend shapes and everything. Um, for combining rock models, well, right now we're just shoving one thing into into the other. Like if you look at this here, and again, we're, I'm not proud of this floor, but I'll just show you real quick here. Like this is, let me turn off my post-process volume real quick. That is just one model. That is just another model. The technique is just, imagine if you, we're a little kid and you had Legos, but the Legos could go through each other. 
<laughs> that's that's what playing with Unreal is. Like, look, just that's another model. This is another model. That's your technique right there. Grab it, put it down or up. That's it. This is another model. Like, look at this. It's completely different. You know, you could see some repetition, but I know that the lighting is going to be so dramatic that you're probably not going to notice that stuff. So, you know, you can't tell. Here, we're going to add more breakup and more puddles and stuff, but that's really the, the only technique. Um, in terms of, like, the, the mountain, maybe next week we could get into some of the stuff because we I still plan on doing more Gaia stuff for the, for the distance stuff, but we'll get into that next week. Classic smasher together. Yeah, it's it's. What's funny is it, it's kind of gone full circle to traditional practical effects, which was like what's called kit bashing, where like ILM uh, model builders for for in Star Wars would go to the to the hobby store, buy a bunch of World War II tanks, a bunch of World War One stuff, even Porsches and modern cars, grab all the parts and smash them together and make a spaceship. So. Um, it's basically the digital equivalent of that, which is pretty cool. Yeah, but you can't do, like before this, we never worked like this because you can't do that. You wouldn't be able to render it. Well, you weren't able to <laughs> render it. And also because of the fact that we're working for, for no one really, like this is our project. And, you know, uh, if you told your supervisor, oh, don't worry, this is, model is going to look fine. You just smash it in and light it dark. Dude, it would never, it would never get approved. But uh, yes. Yeah. We're working around, we know what the next 10 steps are so we could cheat a lot more, so. Okay. So yeah, well, uh, if there's any last questions, it's now or never. If not, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for those that stuck around. Yes, uh, uh, I recognize, I don't say hi because I don't want to disrupt Miguel when he's talking, but I definitely appreciate um, you guys coming in here and dropping a chat i do read it so thank you so much for doing that i really appreciate it yeah thank you yeah. um cool so let me figure out how to get out of this uh all right so okay i know which one to press all right <laughs> see, see you guys okay. bye take care